Amen. Good morning. And welcome to worship. It is wonderful to be here with you uh, live and in person here in the sanctuary, as well as with those of you who are joining us via live stream this morning, as the psalmist proclaims, if this is the day the Lord has made, let us rejoice and be glad in it. Just a few items to lift up with you this morning as we head into this time of worship. Uh, first of all, elders and deacons, we are meeting after worship for our retreat. We're going to be in the parlor. Lunch is going to be served. There's a lot going on after worship. There's communion cleanup. The bells have to be tore down. There's choir practice. But just as soon as we can get started, that would be wonderful. So just please have that in mind. Uh, reminder, Wednesday night, 6 o'clock meal, 6.30 is Bible study, and it's koinonia, right? That's when we come together as a distinct Christian community to love one another, to encourage one another, uh, and, and to lift up uh, Christ within our midst. On the 17th of March, that's two Sundays from today, mark your calendar because after worship in the parlor, we're having a special coffee uh, to celebrate the, uh, the, the impending birth of Bobby and Sarah Schluter's child, and it's, it's a diaper shower. So uh, bear that in mind, and, and please make sure that you uh, plan on attending. Uh, uh, please check the, your bulletin regarding the men's retreat and hog hunt that's coming up. And then we're in a new month. And, and this is the month we've talked about, and it's been in the bridge for a few weeks now. But the first Sunday of the month is communion. The second and fourth Sundays of the month at 9 o'clock in the parlor, we're going to have a time of prayer, intercessory prayer for our congregation, for our community, for our nation, for our elected and appointed uh, uh, people who, who govern over us. Uh, and just individual concerns. So the second and fourth Sundays are prayer at 9. The third Sunday of each month at 6.30 is uh, third Sunday. And at 6.30 that night, there, there's a time of contemporary, uh, non-traditional worship in the parlor, and everybody is invited to come and participate in that intensely family-friendly environment. Okay. Uh, oh, Last thing is in your bulletin, if you would like to participate in the Lily Project, right, the Easter lilies are going to be coming up here very shortly. We're approaching Easter. Uh, the, 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 the money raised goes towards a local mission, and you need to watch the date on that to make sure you have them turned in on time. All right, that's all I have. Uh, I invite you to rise as you're able, pass the peace of Jesus to your neighbor, and uh, please remain... Good morning. Would you join me in our responsive call to worship from Psalm 98? Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and holy arm have worked salvation for him. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shepherd joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of singing, with trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. Shout for joy before the Lord, the King.
Please be seated. This morning, following, following the sermon, we'll be coming to the table that's been prepared by the Lord Himself. And as we come to the table, we want to make sure that we do so in a biblically faithful manner. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Corinth on his second missionary journey, I gave them some very specific uh, instructions as, as to how to do so. And he writes in the 11th chapter, Whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment upon themselves. So this morning, I invite you to pray with me in the unison prayer of confession. We'll then enter into a time of, of quiet personal confession before, we, before receiving the assurance of pardon. Will you please pray with me? Almighty God, you love us, but we do not love you fully. You call, but we do not always listen. We often walk away from neighbors in need wrapped in our own concerns. We often condone evil, hatred, warfare, and greed. God of grace, help us to admit our sin so that as you move toward us in mercy, we may repent, turn to you, and receive forgiveness through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. When we are honest, right? coming before the Lord in a spirit of confession with hearts that are contrite and truly sorry, it is important that we hear the promise that we've been forgiven of sin, that we receive anew the assurance of God's pardon. The prophet Joel lived hundreds of years before Jesus was born, and receiving an oracle, a vision from God, he writes, even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all of your heart with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and He's compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and He relents from sending calamity. Friends, the, the way, the, the means in which God relents from sending calamity is by sending His Son, the Lord Jesus in the world, to become sin for us, to bear the burden that we could not bear ourselves. So this morning, on this beautiful late winter Sabbath day, may we remember fresh the promises that God makes to us in our baptisms as we celebrate that it is in Jesus that we're a forgiven people. Hallelujah. Okay. Amen. Please rise as you're able. seated at this time if we could have the children come forward for the children's message.
Good morning, boys and girls. How are you guys today? Good. I am so glad you're here. All right. I, I lost something. Oh, it's right there. Bill's got it. Oh, here it is. All right. Let's see. Let's, what's in here? All right. Let's see what we got in here today. We've got one of these. All right. We've got one of these. A box. We've got one of these. And we've got one of these. Let's stop with those. So what is this? All right. Who forgot to brush their teeth this morning? Me. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Did you see all the dolls who put their hand up behind you? No, they didn't. All right. So we've got toothbrush. So this is toothpaste. This is soap. And this is a washcloth. So what do you think would happen if I put toothpaste on soap? Ew. Well, what do you think if I used a wash rag with a toothbrush? Ew. Does that work? No. no. We put a toothbrush and toothpaste together to brush our hair. No. 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 What do we do with it? Brush. You brush your teeth. Okay. Well, what do we do with the washcloth and soap? Wash. Wash our body. All right. Now, is that what Jesus does? Yep. Yep. <laughs> I love your confidence. All right. Jesus took something, maybe not so, but like it, and he took a, a, a piece of cloth when he was with his disciples, and he got down on his hands and his knees, and he took a basin of water, and what did he do? Wash whose feet? Whose feet did he wash? The disciples' feet. Nope, he didn't wash his own. He washed his disciples' feet. And he tells us that we are to be like that, which is a way of kind of showing humility um, to others. Yeah, we don't want to get our pants wet. You're right. Yep. So we'd pull up our pants. Yes. So they also would wear sandals. So, and they wa walked in the desert, so their feet would have been kind of dirty. So Jesus washed their feet. Now, who washes our feet? Ourselves, Ourselves or our mom and dad, right? But we see in this picture right here, we've got Jesus washing his disciples' feet. And Jesus is the one who, who really does it all. So when we ask questions and we say, who paid the price for us? The answer is Jesus. Who went to the cross? Jesus. Who made a way to heaven? Jesus. Right. So, when we remember that Jesus loves us so much that he would wash his dirty disciples' feet, he loves us so much that he would go to the cross to forgive us of our sins and die. Isn't that a good news? No. Yes, it is. Yeah, that's good news. So, I want you, next time you're using a bar of soap or your toothbrush, to remember that Jesus is the one who washes all of our sins away. Okay? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Gracious God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for Jesus and all that you do for us. You have made it possible for us to be forgiven. When we don't deserve it and we couldn't earn it, you made a way. So, God, we say thank you. Thanks for loving us, and thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Our first scripture lesson today is from Romans chapter 7. Hear the word of our Lord. Do you not know, brothers and sisters, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law has authority over someone only as long as that person lives? For example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law that binds her to him. So then if she has sexual relations with another man while her husband is still alive, she is called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is released from that law and is not an adulteress if she marries another man. So, my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. For when we are in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us, so that we bore fruit for death. But now, by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we can serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. One night, there was a Viking named Rudolph the Red, and he was looking out the window of his home, and he said to his wife, it is going to rain. His wife asked him, how do you know that? To which he replied to her, because Rudolph the Red knows rain, dear. Oh, come on. I was expecting better than that. All right. Let's pray. God, we do love you, and we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for the opportunity to gather together, and we lift up this reading of your word, and we pray, Lord, that all of our hearts gathered here this day, and the words flowing from my lips will be pleasing in your sight. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so in your bulletin, there's a small white handout that's going to be uh, the, the basic outline for today's message. As we're going through the season of Lent this year, we are looking at great questions about the Christian faith, and these are questions that people outside the faith often ask because they're critical of it or they're seeking answers, and, and, and they're trying to understand in some way or another. And if people outside the church are wondering about these things, that means that people within the church also have questions. So the purpose of this sermon series is twofold. One, it is, it is to equip all of us to be able to answer questions when friends and family and loved ones and neighbors come to us and they ask us questions about what it means to follow Jesus. Remember, right in 1 Peter chapter 3, it tells us that we need to be prepared uh, to make a defense of the hope that we've been given, right? And to do so with kindness and gentleness. The second reason for the sermon series is just for a blessing for all of us. Because I hear so many people say, well, I just believe because I believe. Well, I encourage you to dig deeper. Because if you truly want to know God in a deep and wonderful way, if you really want to, to come to a deep abiding love of Jesus, you must know his word. Right? And his word answers these questions. So if you look on the back page, on February 18th, we, we addressed the question, can you believe the Bible is true? And that Sunday, we looked at the manuscript evidence that showed us that the Christian faith is, is among the most reliably attested to historical events in the history of humanity. The second week, hasn't science disproved Christianity? And we learned that the modern idea of science was actually created by Christian people who were seeking a deeper understanding of God in the natural world. And today we'll be looking at the question, can't we just be good without God? Or another way of asking that question is, why are there so many rules, 
Why can't everything just be subjective? Why, right? Why can't I just know what's right or what's wrong? Why do Christians have to be so about everything? So, I'm going to try to uh, address this question today using the text that Matt read, and we'll be reading from the Gospel of Matthew in a few minutes. But we need to have a basic question that's presented to us. And that question actually comes from Dr. Tim Keller's book, The Reason for God. And that's actually on your handout. It's called The Challenge from Atheism. And the question that comes to the Christian faith is, people say that the Christian faith People who say, excuse me, that the Christian faith, <laughs> I'll get this out of my mouth, right? People who say that the Christian belief in an absolute one-size-fits-all truth that is objectively true for everyone is actually subversive to our individual and communal freedom. Christianity is actually an enemy of authentic personhood, social cohesion, and even freedom. I read about this all the time uh, in the media, in the news, and in people who are attacking the faith. The basic Christian rebuttal to this charge, one for you uh, that, that you could share with people if they bring this to you, is that many people state every person or culture has to define right and wrong for themselves. But if you ask them, is there anyone in the world right now doing things you believe they should stop doing, no matter what they personally believe about the correctness of their behavior, they will invariably say, yes, of course. Then the question arises, well, doesn't that mean that you do believe there is some kind of moral reality that is not defined by us, that must be abided by regardless of what a person feels or thinks? Right? Every person is bound by some kind of moral code, whether they want to admit it or not. For Christians, this moral understanding has been codified in God's law and has been fulfilled in the person of Jesus. I once read, and I can't remember where I read it from, so I'm not able to tell you who, who wrote it, that human beings were not created autonomous, that is, free to be a law unto themselves, but rather human beings were created to be theonomous, subject to the law of God. And this was not a hardship imposed upon humanity. Because God created humanity in such a way that grateful obedience would bring him the highest happiness. The law, which God reveal, the law of God reveals God's character. God is holy. God is merciful. God is just. And God is redemptive. God commands the behavior that pleases him and forbids that which offends him. In the New Testament, I'm sorry, in the Old Testament books of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, we read about God giving his law to Moses, who then revealed it to God's people in the wilderness of Sinai during their 40 years of sojourning in the wilderness. Jewish rabbinic scholars uh, over many years cultivated a, a commentary on Scripture known as the Talmud. Maybe you've heard of the Talmud before. It is sacred Jew, Jewish theological text uh, regarding the interpretation of God's law. And the Talmud says, and we talked about this Wednesday night actually, there are 613 Old Testament laws that must be followed perfectly. There are some Christian groups that have gone back and actually found 630 laws. Now, I don't know about you, but the difference in 613 and 630 is minimal, right? It's both too many and impossible for us all to follow. Now, the law of God has historically been divided into three different categories, and this is known as the threefold purpose of the law. There's the moral, there's the judicial and political, and there's the ritual. So if you look on your handout, it says, what is the law of God? And there is the ritual, cultic, ceremonial, and I, and I forgot to put in there the political and judicial, but that also should be on there. Uh, 
So as we read through the Old Testament, we encounter all three of these, the moral law, the judicial or political law, and the ritual law. The judicial law uh, applied to Israel when she was a particular nation within a particular time in history. Right? She was founded, uh, the, the, the nation of Israel w w was, was founded uh, by, by, by God calling his people together, the 12 tribes of Jacob, and she held together through a loose confederation of tribal, uh, tribal allegiances, and then through the monarchy, right, through Saul and David and Solomon, on down until the year 588 when Judah fell to the Babylonians. When the nation fell... Right? Those laws no longer applied to God's people because they were no longer a state. And these laws consisted primarily of personal injury and protection of property. Right? There's all kinds of laws. If you, if you kill a man's ox, if you harm a man's slave, if you do this, if you do that, then do this. The ritual, the, the, the second one, the ritual or the cultic or the ceremonial law revealed what God desired regarding purity, diet, and temple sacrifice. They were canceled out or they were fulfilled in the New Testament because their symbolic meaning had been fulfilled by the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Put another way, the, the, the temple ceremonies and sacrificial practices that pointed towards the coming Messiah, the coming Savior of God, are no longer applicable because Jesus has fulfilled all of those expectations. And that leaves us the moral law. And the moral law is abundantly set forth within the Ten Commandments, sermons by the prophets, and the teachings of Jesus himself, along with the letters of Paul and Peter in the New Testament. The moral law is understood to be very much in force to this day, while the political and ritual laws are understood to have been fulfilled and are no longer in force today. So one of the arguments I hear people saying regularly is to the effect of, oh my gosh, you know, you break God's law all the time, you Christians, because you're wearing the wrong color or, or the wrong type of fabrics on your body, or you're eating this food or that food. Friends, those laws are no longer in effect. They've been fulfilled by Jesus, but what we are bound by is that moral code expounded by the Ten Commandments, by the prophets, and by Jesus himself. Now, the moral law has three uh, purposes, and those purposes here I have on your sheet under moral law. The first purpose of the law is that it acts as a mirror when we look at it, and it reflects the perfect righteousness of God, and when we look at God's perfect righteousness and it's reflected back on us, it reveals our own sinfulness, our own brokenness, our own shortcomings. Augustine of Hippo, right, the great doctor of the church from the 5th century who lived in North Africa, uh, wrote that the law binds us as we try to fulfill its requirements and become wearied in our weakness under it to know how to ask for the help of God's grace. We realize our need for God's grace. In other words, the law gives us knowledge of our brokenness, of our sinfulness, and it leads us to repentance and faith in Jesus. It reveals our desperate need for somebody to save us from ourselves. The second function of the law is its civil purpose. It restrains evil. That is, when we think of restraining evil within our culture, within our society, we look to civil laws. And most civil laws within cultures that have been impacted by the gospel in some way, shape, or form over the last 2,000 years are grounded in the Ten Commandments. So regardless if you're living in a Muslim-controlled land, right, or if you're across Europe, which is no longer a majority continent, majority people continent, or across North America, or even to countries like Korea, when you look at their civil codes, the laws that keep people living in peace with one another, they are rooted in the moral law of God. 
Then the third function of the law is to guide believers into the good works that God has planned for them. Paul writes about this in the second chapter of Ephesians when he writes, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. To know and follow Jesus is to know and follow the moral law of God. And Jesus reinforces this in Matthew chapter 5, where we read, and if you're curious, this is right after the Beatitudes, right? It's the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus shares this with his disciples. Are we ready with the scripture? There we go. He writes, Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will be, (coughs) excuse me, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of God. So while Jesus sets us free from our sin through his blood on the cross, we have not been set free from the expectations that he's placed on us. In Matthew 28, in the Great Commission, Jesus tells his followers to do all that he has commanded them. In John 14, Jesus states that obedience to his commands proves the reality of a person's love for him. So when we follow the law, this is the third purpose of the law. When we follow the law, we are doing something that pleases God. Do you have a desire to please the one who has saved you? Do your best, not out of some sense of of litigation or or a rote responsibility that you have to follow the laws, but try to follow God's law because of all that God has done for you. Do so joyfully right? Joyfully. So what is the purpose of the law today? Where does it sit with us? To understand the place of the law in our lives today, we could turn to a number of the Apostle Paul's letters for teaching, but I would like for us this morning to look at a pericope from Romans 7 that Matt read for us just a few minutes ago. You know, Romans is widely considered Paul's magnum opus, written to the early believers in Rome during his second missionary journey while he was staying in the city of Corinth. And the importance of this letter cannot be easily overlooked. John Calvin, one of the great founders, one of the great magisterial reformers of the 16th century, and certainly had a tremendous impact upon our tradition, wrote that Romans compressed declarations fast of vast truths, and they're like coiled springs. Once they're loosed, they leap through the mind and the heart to fill one's horizon and shape one's life. John Chrysostom, the golden tongue, widely considered the greatest preacher living in the 5th century, had Romans read aloud to him every single week. Augustine of Hippo, Martin Luther, and John Wesley, one of the founders of the Methodist tradition, three supremely influential leaders of the greater church and Christian heritage, all came to assured faith through the impact the letter of Romans had on their lives. So as we, as we come to chapter 7 this morning, which was our reading, Paul writes in chapter 3 that the law makes us aware of sin. In chapter 4, that the law reveals transgression and brings God's wrath. Then in chapter 5, and most disturbingly, the law has a dangerous liaison with sin. Apart from the law, sin was not reckoned as sin. But now, the law actually incites and triggers sin, which we read this morning. For while we were living in the flesh, Paul writes, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. 
This is all to say that the law in the New Testament retains its function naturally as a straight edge to sin, revealing our need for a Savior, and after salvation, it remains a norm for us for righteous behavior. But the law does not save. Faith in Jesus saves. Following the law is a response to following Jesus. It reveals sin. It shows our need for a Savior. It provides for a righteous way to live. God desires us to do this for him, but God does not force us to do this for him. In seventh grade, my band teacher, Mr. Boone. How many of you had Mr. Boone in junior high school? Oh, there's a lot of hands going up around the room. Mr. Boone was, was a lot of fun. And he liked to tell jokes and tell stories in band class. And I'll never forget the story he told of an old timer named Wendell. And Wendell lived out in a cabin in the woods all by himself. And he was well known in the community for being a poacher of deer. He was never caught by the authorities. Well, there was an old sheriff who lived in that community. He was nearing retirement, and all he wanted to do before he retired was to catch old Wendell poaching a deer. So the sheriff would get up every morning at 4 o'clock. He'd be at Wendell's cabin outside hiding in the bushes. By 5 o'clock, it was still dark outside. He was there before the sun rose so he could catch Wendell. And yet every morning, first thing Wendell would do was open the door and say, Sheriff, I see you out there. Come on in for a hot cup of coffee. The next morning, the sheriff would do it again. And Wendell would come out first thing, Sheriff, I know you're out there. I can see you. Come on in. The next morning, the same thing. The next morning, the same thing. And finally, on his last day, of work. He was going to retire at the end of his shift. Wendell went out hoping that he would catch Wendell, or the sheriff went out hoping he would catch Wendell poaching a deer. And by golly, Wendell came out again. Sheriff, I know you're out there. I can see you. Come on in. Sheriff went in, and as they were enjoying their cup of coffee in front of the fire, he said, Wendell, I've just got to ask you, I've been trying to catch you for decades. How in the world do you always know I'm outside waiting for you? To which Wendell replied, Oh, Sheriff, I never saw you out there. That's the first thing I do every morning. Go outside and say, Sheriff, I see you out there. Come on in and get a cup of coffee. It's the nature of the law, right? God desires us to willingly follow the law, but not to to follow the law in a sense that we've been repressed. Romans 7, chapter 1, verse 1, it reads, Do you not know, brothers and sisters, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law has authority over someone only as long as that person lives? That is, the law has authority only during a person's lifetime. Its authority, in other words, is temporary. Before the time that Jesus was born into the world, it had been understood to be eternal and the ultimate authority in life. But Paul reveals to us that with the incarnation of the flesh and blood of Jesus, the law has been assigned to its proper place, that of a penultimate or a a second to greatest guide to an ultimate savior. In the marriage metaphor that Matt read for us this morning, a wife is bound in fidelity to her husband as long as he lives. But if he dies, she is absolved of his authority. What formerly had been adultery is now a legal right. She may legally marry another man. Now, we must understand this analogy with what Paul writes at verse 6. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. See, freedom from the law does not leave us in a a neutral state of being non-committed. Either a person transfers their allegiance to Jesus Christ or falls back under the authority of sin and the law. And the Greek here is in the passive tense, and we could understand it by what scholars call the divine passive. The Greek literally can be translated as, you were put to death 
but should be understood in context is God has put you to death. God has put you to death, and it testifies to God's initiative in the work of salvation. It was God who killed the effects of sin, God who killed the effects of the law, God who killed the effect of death in us, and raised us in Jesus to live in freedom and fruitfulness for himself. So, to bring all this together, because some of your heads were probably just bumbling around right now. If we have been set free from the law, why are we still bound by the moral law of God? As people who have been set free by the self-sacrificial work of God in Jesus on the cross at Calvary, we are grateful for what God has done for us, for the extreme extent of his love for us. And out of thankfulness, And out of gratitude, not out of compulsion, but completely in love, we desire to live in a manner pleasing to God. God's law provides us with stability, with insight into the world. It it reveals the power of God's love and provides a better way for us to live. We do not follow it to be saved but as a response in gratitude for being saved. Following God's law sets us free to live better lives for ourselves, for our neighbors, and most importantly, for God. A musician, a musician binds him or herself to their craft through rigorous practice. That's the law. And this enables them to excel when they play in concert. That's grace. That's the love of God for those who love him. It is good to have order in our lives in a world that is living in disorder. Let us now turn our attention to this table that has been set before us. This is a table of perfect order. Is prepared by the Father through the work of the Son and bathed in the Spirit, giving us a small foretaste of the great banquet to come when we enter into glory. So I invite you, if you are able, to please rise at this time as we confess the faith of the church through the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.
seated. The Lord Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. The Lord also said, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day, for my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Within our tradition, we understand this to be that, spirit, that Jesus is spiritually present within the bread and within the cup. As we come to the table, will you please pray with me? It is truly right in our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O Lord our God, creator and ruler of the universe. You established your people to be a light for the nations and called us to walk in your paths to follow your ways. Even now you are coming to bring justice and peace to the world. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with choirs of angels, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all the faithful of every time and place who forever sing to the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Despite our brokenness and our sinfulness, you did not break your covenant promises to us. In Christ Jesus, you drew near to us for our salvation, teaching us to live in faith and to seek the good of all. Through his dying and rising, you brought life to the world. And remembering your gracious acts in Jesus, we take from your creation this bread and this cup and joyfully celebrate his dying and rising as we await the day of his second coming. It is with thanksgiving that we offer our very selves to you to be a living and holy sacrifice dedicated to your service. Most gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and cup that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Jesus. Transform these simple elements of the earth into the mysterious and the holy. And by your spirit, unite us with Christ and with all in your church and all of the world. Keep us faithful and alert for the hour of Christ's coming. Let us live honorably as children of truth and of light so that we may eat and drink together in your eternal realm. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, now and forever. And now, Lord, we pray together the prayer Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. In the letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he goes on to say, For I received from the Lord that which I pass on to you, that on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread, and after giving thanks to his heavenly Father, he broke the loaf, saying, This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In a like manner, after supper, he took the cup and said, This cup represents the new covenant, the new promise sealed in my blood for the remission of sin. Do this as often as you will in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat of this bread and you drink from this cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes again. Amen. Could we have the uh, forward, please? Uh, if you're here today as a visitor, or if you've been here your whole life, it doesn't matter. 
If you believe in Jesus, if you love Jesus, if you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are invited to come and to partake in his Holy Supper. The table is prepared. We would invite sections one and two to come over here, section one first, and then section three and section four to come over here, starting with section three. The table is set. You may come.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to join with you through communion, knowing that you are at work, that you have been at work since the beginning of the world. We ask that you would use the act of receiving your communion in our lives, God, that we would go forth sharing the good news of Jesus, the good news that you have bestowed in our life. Lord, use us. Help us to uh, not be shy and bashful, but to go forth carrying the good news wherever we go. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. As you're able, and we'll sing the benediction together.